Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Gillingham Library. It's really delightful to see so many of you out on this cold and rainy evening. Tonight, we will be celebrating the life and the work of inventor and engineer Verena Holmes. And this is the latest in a series of talks and events celebrating the life and achievement of six women with a personal connection to Gillingham. We have Sarah Forbes Benita, who was an African princess and a friend to Queen Victoria. We have Kathleen Courtney, who was a suffragist and a world-renowned peace campaigner. We have Verena Holmes, who we're going to hear about tonight, who was an inventor and engineer. And then we have Eileen, otherwise known as Terza Garwood, who was a talented artist. And then we have Dr. Lorna Wing, who was a pioneering psychiatrist, who coined the phrase the autistic spectrum. And then we have, of course, Rosemary Tonks, the writer, whose work was republished earlier this year. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Helen Close from the Women's Engineering Society. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. As Sarah says, I'm Helen Close. I am Heritage Officer for the Women's Engineering Society. Um, and some of you may have heard of us, some of you may have not. Who has heard of the Women's Engineering Society before you came along today? Bob? Yeah, one or two, but not, <laughs> not many people have heard of us, which um, unfortunately um, is quite sad, but one of my roles is to try and raise our profile by looking at some of the uh, previous women engineers in our history. So just a bit of background information. The Engineering Society, Women's Engineering Society, was formed on the 23rd of June, 1919, which is actually, uh, the 23rd of June is also Verena Holmes's birthday. Um, it was formed in the aftermath of World War I, during which time the women had been called to fill the jobs of the men away at war. Many of these jobs had been in the engineering sector and women had received training and good pay. And some of them were actually pretty good at it. After the war, the restoration of the Pre-War Practices Act meant the women should go back to whence they came. Many wanted to be able to continue in their newfound careers. So in 1919, seven formidable ladies formed the Women's Engineering Society. Their goal was to support and train women in engineering careers. And it's still our aim today. However, there are still only 16.5% of women making up the engineering workforce in the UK. It is, it is higher in other countries. The Society has, pr has produced the Women Engineer Journal quarterly since it began in 1919. It's a fantastic resource and archive, and it is available online through the Institute of Engineering and Technology. So I recommend if you're interested in engineering, women's engineering, history, log on and have a look because it's fantastic, a fantastic resource. As part of our 100 year anniversary in 2019, the, the journal was digitised, and as I say, it can be accessed online. And one of our fearless volunteers took it upon herself to index all the women that were named in this publication. It's not that she didn't have anything better to do, but um, it's a really, really good thing that she has actually done. Um, and as part of our centenary plans, which were funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, we endeavoured to find out more about these women. And one of them is Verena. So who was she? I'm going to do a quick overview before I go into more detail, and this will sound like something from Wikipedia. So Verena was born in Ashford in Kent in 1889 to Edmund Holmes, a civil servant, poet and schools inspector, and Florence Mary Syme. She had a brother called Morris, who was also a civil servant, and a sister, Ruth, who became a writer. She was educated at Oxford High School for Girls, and after leaving school, worked briefly as a photographer. The outbreak of the First World War enabled her to start working at the Integral Propeller Company in Hendon on manufacturing wooden propellers. There are also records that suggest that she may have been working as a nurse because there's a British Red Cross record for her. While working, Holmes attended night classes at Shoreditch, Shoreditch Technical Institute. She then moved to Lincoln to work for the industrial engine ma manufacturer Rus Ruston and Haw Hornsby where she started as a supervisor for women em employees, responsible for the selection, control and welfare of 1,500 women employees. 
Due to the relaxation of working conditions in war wartime, she persuaded the company to let her become an apprentice in the works. And she was able to complete an apprenticeship. Unlike most of her contemporaries, she continued to be employed by the company after the end of the war and by 1919 was working in the drawing office. Marina graduated from Loughborough Engineering Co College in 1922 with a BSc in engineering. And during the 1920s, she traveled to work in the US. She joined the Institute of Mechanical Engineers in 1924, their first woman, but she was only allowed to become an associate member, not a full member, until 1944. And she actually applied to join in 1920. And you'll see here, so this was 1921, this is a record of her applying. Um, committee rec recommendation was to sit and wait. They weren't ready for a woman yet. And in the actual records of where her name is, it's Miss is underscored several times um, to highlight the fact that this is actually a woman. What the special letter was, we don't know, and I would love to find it and do a little bit more research as to who wrote it. But basically, they were not going to let her in, even though it had been, the application had been signed by her uncle. Um, they weren't going to let her. They weren't going to let her through the doors. She was elected, the, elected president of the Women's Engineering Society in 1930 and 1931, and she was actually the first practicing engineer to hold that position. She was very active in WES, very, very active in promoting courses for girls and young women. She has a multitude of patents to her name, and in collaboration with R.C. Wingfield, the brother of one of her friends, Molly Wingfield, she developed the, wing, the homes of Wingfield Neuro... I can't say this very well, neurothorax apparatus for the treatment of tuberculosis in the home. During World War II, she acted as advisor to Ernest Bevin on munitions training, and in 1946, which is what I'm sure you're all here to hear, hear about, she set up Homes and Leather with fellow WES member Sheila Leather here in Gillingham, employing only women. Unfortunately, Verena died in, Fe in February 1964. Verena's life, as with many women's histories, may have been reduced to a few paragraphs similar to, what I, to those I have just read out to you. But during our centenary year, we received an email to the office from Verena's goddaughter's son, who had in his possession diaries and letters written by Verena. A few call, phone calls later, and I was excited to receive this box containing 17 of Verena's diaries and letters and other papers. At the time, Wes was running a project to raise the electronic profile of women engineers on Wikipedia. But when COVID hit, the diaries seemed a sensible resource to turn our attention to. The diaries were digitised, the manuscripts were actually scanned in, and they were distributed electronically to a team of Wes members who painstakingly transcribed them whilst on furlough. The diaries are now in the archives at the IET in London and the transcripts need to be edited because Verena's handwriting was very difficult to read and some of our members haven't been able to actually tra transcribe what the, everything that she was saying just because, as I say, her handwriting um, is difficult to read. And there, there is also words that, that have fallen out of use even in the, in the half century since she's not been with us. So we've got 17 diaries. They, we've got two tranches of them, 1945 to no, 1947, which is great because that covers the end of the, First World, uh, the Second World War and also covers Verena's plans for setting up her business. And then 1957 to 1959. There are seven letters that were written in the 1920s and postcards, including one from her father to her friend. Um, so, and we, we know the provenance of this material, which is great. Um, They've donated by um, Holmes's goddaughter's son, um, who um, Holmes's friend Nancy Johnson um, is the lady that Verena left these diaries with. So the diaries they cover day-to-day -day minutiae. So um, Verena talks about shopping for clothes, for hats, the use of coupons, lunches, clubs, dinners. She always seems to have been at lunch or tea. Um, visiting art galleries. She talks about repairing her clothes and washing her frocks, dentists and doctors and hair appointments. But she also talks about more um, political and professional things. 
um, including the war as well. She talks about places that were bombed. She compares the end of the Second World War to the end of the First World War. She talks about the roles of those around her and her engineering interests and talks about it's very important for Wes's history as well because we find out lots of background information and lots of tittle-tattle that go, goes, goes on at council meetings that we weren't party to before. Um, and we certainly get a different angle on them. It appears that Verena writes up her diaries from notes after the event, but they always seem very fresh, as if, they, as if she's talking to you. When you're actually reading it, it's as if she's talking to you. She writes of her work, her friends, her family and her colleagues, the weather and how she experiences it, her health, which isn't particularly good, travel and transport, projects and meetings, and wartime shopping. To quote from the diary, one of the council has a wholesale electrical, company, equipment, electrical equipment business in Bridge Street. She told us that some Pyrex dishes had just come in, so we went along to her shop and bought up most of them. But she glosses over some of the most important occasions. But anyhow, I'm not going to waste time describing the procession, which everyone has heard or read about, and that's when she's talking about the Victoria Day procession um, in May 1945. We get dialogue and description, and there are some flashbacks to her early life, like holidaying in Switzerland with her friend Molly Wingfield. But she writes them for people who are interested in them, and she lends her diaries out. She writes to Nancy Johnson, who, who the provenance of where we've got the diaries from. She writes to her in June 1928. I'm glad you enjoyed my French diary. I was afraid it might, write, it might seem rather dull to anyone else. So interesting to me because it recalls the people, places and people. I will give you my American one someday, which I think is more interesting. In the diary in February 1946, she says, my diary, which is a long way behind, I can't think why I go on with this silly thing, but somehow it's difficult to leave off when I have got into the habit of writing it. So why are the diaries important? Well, they tell us about women's experience working during the war and afterwards, and they tell us about Verena's own experiences. We hear about other female engineers and their thoughts and plans for after the war. And as I've said before, it's a good strong link for Wes and our history. So, we join Verena in her diary on Thursday, February the 8th. She's 56 years old when we join her, and she's in Manchester, 1945, which she does not like. It's too cold off in Manchester. Thursday, February the 8th. Here I am, convalescing from sinus trouble, with the pleasant prospect of going to London tomorrow to recuperate for a week. On account of the coal shortage, I didn't have a fire in my sitting room, but sat in the, in the Playden's kitchen living room when I wasn't packing. There was a cold wind, and I only went as far as the post office. To our great joy and relief, the coalman came last, at last and delivered 200 weights, which the doctor had ordered for me a week ago. That will keep the Playdens going while I'm away until they get their proper delivery. The weather is terrible and the shopping is not up to London standards by, by Verena's um, reckoning. However, I must admit that one can generally find most of the things one wants there if one is not looking for taste or quality. <laughs> she goes to London to shop whenever possible, but she does enjoy walking in the, in the moorland scenery at the weekends. The Verena, at this point in time, doesn't feel, at 56... She's, that she doesn't feel that she's fulfilled her career aims. She writes of her circle of friends who are mainly engineers who are in civil service roles. But as the, war is, the end of the war is in sight, um, they are all contemplating their futures and some of them have already been released from their jobs. On her holiday to London at the beginning of these diaries, it is clear that she's in the process of negotiating her position. She's currently working at the Ministry of Aircraft Production at Millbank, and she's looking at getting a good enough civil service job in London. She definitely wants to move away from Manchester, too cold in Manchester. And she wants to work in the field of production efficiency. Between 1940 and 1944, we know that she was at the headquarters um, as a technical officer with the Ministry of Labour where she was in charge, as I said previously, um, of a number of technical women officers at different locations. She was quite newly transferred to the Ministry of Aircraft Production, and she's also teaching at the Government's Motion Studies School, which has been established at Metro Vicar in, in Manchester, under the auspices of a lady called Anne Gillespie Shaw, who is also another one of our WES engineers. She's lucky she's still in her civil service job, 
Um, but civil service roles run in her family, her brother her, un- her, her brother, her father, and her uncles. It's a good, safe option for Verena, but she also feels she wants to have a show of her own, her own engineering company. And this is a picture of the um, staff and course members at um, the um, motion study course, and there's Verena there. So. The women we hear about in the diaries, we hear about Verena herself. I won't go through all of these women, all of these women, just a, few, a couple of them. Um, Margaret Partridge, um, Claudia Parsons, Stella Rennie Taylor, Sheila Leather, Anne Gillespie Shaw, Gertrude Entwistle, Caroline Hazlitt, and Margaret Robotham. These women are all in different possessions at the end of the war, and some are tra- professionally trained engineers. Some moved into engineering as a result of the war and or, or as a result of their interest in aeroplanes, motorcycles and cars. And what I love about so many of our women engineers is how many of them are in, into fast cars, aeroplanes, motorcycles. Um, it, it's fantastic, fantastic um, women with lots of enthusiasm and energy. The ones who are not tr- professionally trained as engineers have taken various short training courses designed to get women into an industry. Margaret Partridge, Steli Renitalia and Sheila Leather were women technical officers with the Ministry of Labour under Verena's headquarters role. Anne Gillespie Shaw and Caroline Hazlitt have secured positions at at national level, um, but Verena seems to have been passed over. And Gertrude Entwistle is established in a long-term engineering um, position at Metro Vickers. Claudia Parsons remained in the Ministry of Labour and Margaret Robotham, formerly of Galway Engineering, seems to have sat the war out. So I've just briefly sort of tried to um, say what these women were doing because Verena talks about them as she's contemplating what she is going to do. So this is Margaret Partridge. In March 1945, Verena receives a letter from her. When I got home, I found a letter from Partridge. When she is free from the Ministry of Labour, she's going to run another hotel, run a nursing home for her sister Joyce, and she talks over the RME, REME workshop and manufacturing something. It all sounds crazy to me. Any one of those jobs could occupy her full time. And why take on two engineering jobs before she finds that she can't find employment in engineering? However, it's her affair. Marina describes Partridge as one of my technical women officers who she oversaw in her original World War II position in the Ministry of Labour. Partridge is also putting forward for industrial schemes in March 1945. Months ago, she had written a memorandum recommending the use of a government factory for research into industrial conditions that make for high output, etc. Then there's Anne Gillespie Shaw. Verena worked quite closely with Anne at the motion studies courses and um, there seems to have been, not backbiting going on, but um, Anne would often not put Verena forward for things Um, and she was actually described by one of Verena's friends as an anti-feminist because she wouldn't put Verena forward because she she wanted the kudos for everything that Verena was, was doing. After leaving the ministry, Rennie Taylor goes into the UNRA, which is the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration for a while, which apparently was a common route for people who didn't want to get back to normal life after the war. Verena says she has a lot of capability, but no very, very definite training. Rennie Taylor tells Verena that she plans to start a bureau for foreigners. Then there's Margaret Robotham who worked at Galway Engineering Company in Tongland, Kirkcudbright in Scotland. She is an original council council member of the Women's Engineering Society and helped form the society in 1919. She subsequently took a course in laundry and then worked with Margaret Partridge on her electrical work in the 1920s and 30s. She joined with Partridge for the hotel enterprises and does not seem to have worked in engineering during the war. So what are Verena's options? She could take a civil service job, preferably with responsibility on policy and schemes for training in the production and efficiency, such as her, what she terms her college factory scheme. She says in February 1945, I promised to send him, Paisa, the notes on both my training schemes. And one of those training schemes, she'd actually given her notes to Anne Gillespie Shaw and then they disappeared. 
the one for training would-be engineers from the forces, which I did when I was in the appointments departments, and which I was disappointed at not being allowed to follow up, and the one for training in efficiency method, methods, a college factory idea, which I did to please myself, and which Watson Smythe, head of the training department, talked down. Early in March 1945, she says, I've decided that I must at any rate sit tight until the end of March and not show my hand to the Ministry of Aircraft Production, as they can dismiss me without any notice until my six months is up, which it will be by then. After that, they have to give me six months notice. One thing I am determined is that I'm not to spend another winter up here if there's anything else I can do. Of course, at the end of the war, there will probably be a gen general discharge of technical staff from government departments, and there will, there will follow a game of musical chairs, so my timing may need to be rather good. She has discussions with Shaw in April 1945. Then she questioned whether or not I had a moral obligation to the map to stay. I said I had considered it, but it didn't weigh heavily upon me, as I will have, I will have stayed and been useful for seven months after having only received instructions for three. During that time, Matt could have, could have got hold of me at any time that suited them, and they hadn't brought me back to London in six months, as they said they would. It was true, I was doing £400 a year job at an £800 salary, but that wasn't my fault. She could get a job in industry, but she doesn't want to go back to her previous company of working with Research Engineers Limited. In October 1945, she says, I fancy he, Gavin Goodhart, wants to offer me a job, but I didn't think they could pay me the salary I'm used to. And it would feel as if Aunt Elf used to express it, like going back into the pod that you've burst. Or she could own her own factory, something that she'd always thought of doing. On returning from our holiday, she says in February 1945, I went straight to Metro Vic Vickers where I found only Evans. He is the businessman of our party, being in peacetime the secretary of a stationery company, and he told me a lot about starting a company because I still sometimes toy with the idea of an all-women's women, works. I might go all out for it if I, kept, if I had real inspiration as to what I should manufacture. And then she also says, I think it would be a good idea to start with something like that which could be mainly assembly work and would need little plant and then branch out into more interesting work when it was a running concern. By April 1946, she's still feeling despondent about the lack of op offers of, or the prospect of having, having to accept lower paid jobs than she feels she's worthy of. She's carried out a lot of groundwork and she's made proposals and training courses to government departments and they're all passed over and she's fed up of others taking the credit for her work. So April 1946, still no letters of appointment to any of the staff of the new department except permanents like Pizer and Miss White. Today, MAP comes to an end, being merged into the Ministry of Supply. And then she also says, on the other hand, I've always wanted a show of my own and I feel it's now or never. I ought to get going before any possible slump is within sight. If I leave it much longer, I shall be too old. Besides, if I took, another, if I took the other job, I should always have the sneaking feeling that I was doing it out of cowardice. She also says, I'm particularly annoyed to find out that the salary range, the salary range of the grade they proposed to put me on is between £635 and £815 for women, which is lower than the grade I officially came in at in 1940, which started at £650. A conflict goes on in the back of my mind all the time as to whether I should accept the Board of Trade offer or not. Of course, all my sane friends in, um, advise me to. The salary is one I can save on, disappointed though I am about it. I would get five weeks holiday a year and the work is interesting. So she's toying with the idea of setting up a business and she's looking for a business partner. She settles on Sheila Leather. Now Sheila um, used to be one of Verena's technical officers. She knows Leather has been trained in training engineers um, and all of the women that would be employed will need an element of training. Verena wants to make sure that she starts off with something that's low skilled so that she can develop those skills for the, the, the women. Um, she thinks Leather gets on with um, more people and is more generally likeable. Um, but Verena knows that Leather likes her a lot. And Verena likes her too, but she's a bit too jolly hockey sticks. Leather also has two sisters who have quite a lot of money and they actually invest in the company. Now, Sheila Leather was born in Cheshire in, 19, in 1898, where her father was an analytical chemist. 
Um, before the Second World War, she was a physical a PE training lecturer at Hockerill Training College in Hertfordshire, and we're still trying to uncover more about Sheila. So if anybody's got any background information, please send it our way. Um, so Verena writes in her diary, Leather is the third of my ex-women's tech my ex-women technical officers I've had a meal with in 24 hours. Whitehall Court houses several clubs which all use a common dining room. There were four of us, Leather's sister, a widow, Mrs Hutchinson, who is secretary of the Ladies' Golf Club and lives there. The other two women, ex-technical officers, are Partridge and, and Rennie Taylor that we mentioned earlier. So to quote from the diary again, I was just finishing packing my books and belongings into a suitcase when Leather appeared. She's overjoyed at the idea of coming in with me on the business and her sister is very sportingly going to put in £500. I don't know whether I've ever described her. She's dumpy. <laughs> she, she is a dumpy, grey, she is dumpy, grey-haired and plain, about 54 I think. People like her and she's very energetic and sensible. She will always pull her weight or work in any undertaking. She has a certain naivety, which may be disarming or irritating according to how you feel about it. Claudia used to say her letters were museum pieces for a sort of old-fashioned coyness. She has a bad, ha bad habit of beginning many thank yous for your letter. However, these little things are not so in evidence when you're face to face with her. And altogether, I think she will make a very satisfactory partner. How wrong she was. <laughs> I went home to pack and have tea before my journey to the cooks. I found a letter from Heather, uh, leather, <laughs> leather, leather. She has given a month's notice at the Ministry of Labour, but she wants to have a holiday after that if possible. I could do with her earlier, but I won't try and influence her. I wish she didn't have to say her, start her letter with higher pard. But as I say, she is better in the flesh than on paper. And I know she's a real, she really is a treasure. And so, Holmes and Leather was born. As well as finding a business partner, Verena's time was also taken up in trying to decide what to manufacture, where to manufacture it, and also somewhere to live, live nearby for herself. So to turn to the manufacturing, she had to decide on a product. March, March the 20th, 1945. I was discussing my wish to start a factory if only I could find something to manufacture when Irene Hilton made a very bright suggestion, prams. It appears there's nothing between a good pram, very rare, costing 25 to 30 pounds, and utility ones which are cheap and nasty and hardly last six months. March the 26th, 1945, I spent the evening with the Evanses, part of it well spent measuring up their preambulator with a view to my possibly setting up as a manufacturer. They had had to pay 25 pounds for it second hand, but it seemed very cheaply constructed. March 1946, 15th of March 1946, so this is another year later, I wrote to them about my proposal to make Yankee screwdrivers and they gave me an address in Hackney and told me to ask for Mr John Neal. When I saw him, he wasn't at all encouraging. I had been told that nobody was making Yankees in this country and he said, on the contrary, there were three firms that made them for a long time and two more were going to go into production. So that knocks that idea on, on the head. Um, that Yankee screwdrivers are like the ratchet screwdrivers with interchangeable heads. She also looks at... A fireplace invention, um, her friend um, Hugh and Mumby, um, it would need very little plant as it is built up of welded sheet metal, but it would be rather dull. And she does later on in her diaries talk about um, um, manufacturing or designing um, a, a, a heater, fireplace heater, which also has the ability to have a, um, a ring on the top of it, a hot plate on the top of it. Um, it's a rotate, rotating fire um, with a hot, hot plate on top of it. And she also looks at the idea of producing map measurers and parallel rulers. But finally, in 1946, she settle, settles on shear, metal shear cutters. Hirchfield started by suggesting things that were too ambitious for me, lathes and so forth. I said no, that would require good machine tools to produce, which would be expensive, and they would have to be new, and that would mean waiting a long time for delivery. I must have something which would need few and expensive, inexpensive tools that could be put into production quickly with semi-skilled labour. After some more thought, he produced a picture of a hand lever operated shearing machine for angle iron and plate. Now that seemed a good idea to me. So finally, April the 15th, 
my first day of being my own master. I went to Euston Road and looked at the shearing machines in several shops. I finally bought one for eight pounds, which I shall take as my model for costing purposes to be collected by the Research Engineers Limited. Initially, she wanted to make a big size one, but somebody suggested a miniature one would be more popular for model makers, and, and that, that's what they did. They named it the Bantam, and Verena produces, produces them, and she takes them for demo, demos in her suitcase, and everyone falls in love with them. Eventually, Homes and Leather also produced paper cutters. And this, this is an advert from 1956. So we've got the Bantam Shearer. We've got the guillotine safety guard, and I've got a photograph of one of those because we've got one in our collections. Um, and then the rod cutter, and then top secret. We don't actually know what that was. <laughs> I think it's the card cutter. It's a card cutter. Um, but um, there is a picture. I don't know whether anybody's ever used one that old. The library might still have one. <laughs> um, we actually bought that, that one um, on eBay. Um, but it, was, um, it, it had the safety guard, which meant that it could be used, used in schools. So, Building the staff at Homes and Leather. The factory is situated in Gillingham, where we are today, um, in order to take advantage of the government help for depressed areas. Part of Verena's motivation is setting up, um, in setting up the company is the training of females in engineering. And she calls on the labour exchange to find women to lo work locally with, um, with the machines or to work the machines. There's also interest from other women engineers and she recruit, recruits women for other positions in the organisation. And she also, also takes on a works manager called Ruth Farris. But that is another story in its own right. But by 1947, the cracks begin to show in the business par partnership. To quote, leather is very sour, sour and jealous of Farris, I suppose because Farris is in our drawing office, but with both Miss B and Diana in the lower office, where could I put her? And then, rather tellingly, with regards to her relationship with Sheila Leather, she writes, I'm afraid she started off with rather an adolescent crush on me, and that makes her jealous of Farris on two schools. One being that Farris, or F and I, as she refers to them in her, in, in her diary, understand each other without difficulty, and the other that she, think, she likes to think of herself as a heaven-born engineer, and Farris, by her much greater skills, which I won't admit, debunks that. It's all very worrying and tiresome, and I don't know quite what to do about it. How I hate emotional entanglements with my own sex. Only a week, ago, a week or so ago, Leather told me that she wouldn't be anywhere else or doing anything else for the world. And there is a picture of the works manager, Ruth Farris, always referred to as Farris, never by her first name. And there we have some more pictures of one of the workers and also Miss Glasspool, who worked in the office. And there we have a picture of Verena with Farris. Okay. So I mentioned about the two tranches, of two, two tranches of diaries we have for 1945 to 1947, which tell of the starting up of the company. I will skip now because there's so much information. I mean, the transcriptions of the, the, the first um, tranche of diaries amounts to 126,000 words. Um, so there's a lot of information in there and I wouldn't want to go... Uh, I don't think it would bore you by a long shot, but you'd be here for quite a long time. <laughs> So, at the end of the second tranche of diaries, so in 1959, 18th of December, F was in just the same grim, grim mood this morning, going over and over her version of what happened. Why had, I, why had I pretended to be her friend for 10 years? She walked out in the middle of the morning and stayed out. Nobody knew where she'd gone. I admit it was a relief to be shut of her but she looks so demented when she's in one of her moods that I always fear she might commit suicide. The fact is, it's a week before her period is due, and that, it, that is always a time of danger, but recently she's been very serene and amiable for a couple of months or more. So that's about her relationship with um, Faris. Things are, things are cracking there in terms of work and um, personal relationships as well. Wednesday, the 8th of April, 1959. 
I've put the, I've put the barrister's works as my address opposite. So this is a page at the beginning of um, the 1959 diary. Um, and when Verena writes her diaries on the front fly leaf, she writes her address. Um, so in, in this particular entry, she says, I've put Beresford's works as my address opposite, but actually in three weeks' time, my connection with it will be severed. Yet I have no other permanent address to give, and Farris, for a few months anyhow, can be relied to forward things on to me. The shares of the company of Homes and Leather will be bought by Mr R.B. Black, a retired tea merchant from Assam, who, once, who was once an engineer and is now in the middle, in, in the middle 50s at, at a price that will give the shareholders quite a nice little return on their money and is hailed with joy by all the share, shareholders, especially myself. The diary ends on the 30th of April, my last day at the works. It was chiefly used by both Farris and me, clearing out our personal possessions and putting them into small tea chests for transport. We took a taxi in the evening to take them to our homes. Verena died in 1964, and in her will, she leaves a substantial amount of money to Farris. What their relationship was, we don't know. I'm aware that there are other diaries of Verena's in existence, with her niece Caroline, who is also mentioned in the diaries. I believe that these cover the world period of World War I. And we're hoping at some stage that um, her niece Caroline will leave them the diaries to, um, to us at the Women's Engineering Society. So that's a great picture there. This is a picture of um, Verena with um, her friend Nancy and her two um, goddaughters. Um, and I think it's this daughter whose son has given us the diaries. But the Women's Engineering Society, we were all about encouraging women engineers and making sure the stories are heard. And we were really, really pleased that in March 2021, Canter Canterbury Christchurch University named their multi-million pound STEM facility after Verena. So, I could have gone on for longer. Um, there's so much in information in these diaries. Um, and you could pick a topic and have a whole talk out of that topic. I just wanted to cover really the beginnings of the factory, Verena's decisions, why she made those decisions, um, and um, the closure of the company in, 19, in 1959. Um, I must also thank um, a lady called um, Catherine Kirk, who's worked, she's not here tonight, um, but she's worked very closely with me on the diaries um, and some of the work that you saw, was some of the um, presentation there was her, her work and her research as well. So I don't know whether anybody's got any questions, but I'd just like to say thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you ever so much for your attention and for coming out tonight and for your enthusiasm. I would like to thank Helen Close for being a fantastic speaker and being so enthusiastic. Um, I would like to thank our library staff, Jess, Sophia and Henry. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Bob for coming along with the Ashford Museum and for the lovely exhibition, which I will uh, encourage you to come along. Um, I'd like to thank Piers for filming and for being so helping, helpful, and uh, Sophia from KMTV. So thank you very much and thank you for coming.